The Tom Woods Show, episode 2215. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Come on now, folks. If you ain't going to start that side hustle now, then when? Check out my free ebook, Five Paths to an Online Income, where I take you step by step through five things that I do that keep food on the Woods household table and how you can do them too. Check it out at pathstoincome.com. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here. I'm very glad to be joined by our old friend, Jared Casey, who is, uh, are you Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at University College Dublin? Uh, yes, indeed. Yes. All right. Okay. Is that a fancy way of saying you are more or less at liberty to sit around all day now? What does that mean? Uh, it's a fancy way of saying they kick me out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. But usually if they kick you out, they don't give you the honorary title of emeritus. <laughs> well, I might be slightly exaggerating. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, I say that only because I do have some friends who've been sort of kicked out who do not have the title of emeritus. I won't mention their names right now on the air. Well, anyway, I want to talk to you. Of course, you've written very important books. And this is one from a couple of years ago that you sent me and then I put it somewhere. And the other day I said, oh my gosh, I never talked to him about this. And that is the book Hidden Agenda, Transgenderism's Struggle Against Reality. Now, this will be a controversial episode, but the funny thing is like six years ago, it wouldn't have been controversial at all. And just in the sweep of that amount of time, not only has a certain way of looking at the world won the day, but you are dismissed from society if you don't go along with it. It's absolutely crazy. Absolutely crazy what's been going on. So I have a bunch of questions I want to ask you about. I mean, normally, I like to just let these conversations flow, but I have to say, this is going to be a bit more of a question-answer, question-answer style, just because there are so many questions that I think occur to people of goodwill when they encounter this issue. I will tell you, maybe off the air, I'll give the person's identity, but I think somebody both of us know who lives in the UK, who has written some very challenging and important books, is a very secular person, not religious at all, who was absolutely appalled at the whole agenda, what's going on in the law with regard to transgenderism and so on. But yet the last thing in the world he wants to do is write a book on it. The last thing in the world. Now, this is supposedly a marginalized group and we have to make all kinds of accommodations for them. But you know, what kind of a marginalized group is it? where everybody's afraid to say anything about them. <laughs> you know, this, it's a crazy upside down. I'm a marginalized group, right? There's, there's nobody cheering me on in Hollywood. There's nobody cheering me on in the White House. I'm a marginalized group. You're listening to one right, right now. So <laughs> any, anyway, you nevertheless decided, I think I'm going to step into this. What yeah, were you thinking, man? I it must have been crazy. I do talk about it in the preface saying- I know, it, that's actually where I got the idea. Yeah, and had a- odd experience with my publisher with whom I published already three books. So I had a good relationship. And he came back to me after I sent him the manuscript. And he said, I've never experienced so much hostility from my editorial board. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I, you know me, Tom, I'm sometimes I let myself go a little. <laughs> but as I did, for example, in the previous book after me too, but on this book, given the nature, very controversial nature of the topic, I was, I've been extraordinarily restrained. And I've gone out of my way on many occasions in the book to say that I'm not actually trying to inflict harm on anybody. I don't want to call anybody names. That my aim, in fact, is not to prevent people of mature age and discretion from making whatever choices they want to make in regard to surgery or hormones. But rather, I'm talking about what the law in particular, now in Ireland and England, and indeed after the Bostock decision in the USA, what the law is actually going to require me to do, which is in certain circumstances, either to remain silent or to tell a lie. And I object to that. I thought that was kind of very restrained. Yeah, yeah, it is. And the thing is, I think for a while, I just had a lot of things on my plate and this issue was kind of bubbling around. And I think I just figured, well, this is crazy. This will blow over. This involves all kinds of propositions that nobody honestly believes. Like this is one of those things that regimes all over the world love stuff like this. They absolutely love it. They thrive on it. They thrive on something that goes against all common sense and reality. 
So they love the struggle for quote unquote equality because that can mean anything, absolutely <laughs> anything. Yeah. And they can use it as a bludgeon forever and they can use it as a pretext for more and more power. But they also like things, as I say, like this one, where they're forcing you to believe something that you have very, very good reason not to believe. I actually am going to go so far as to say that I have a theory that, yeah, there are some true believers in this, but I also believe there are some sinister people who view this as the ultimate form of humiliation. That, yep, we're going to get your kids to believe this, and we're going to get your kids to do all these radical things to themselves, and we're going to make you too scared to say anything about it. And we might, if we're really lucky, we'll get you to be so dumb you actually cheer it. You know, and I can't prove that. I can't prove that that's what's motivating them, but it sure makes more sense than, than, than anything else. And, and the, the way yeah. they've, I, I beg your pardon, I'm so, and I'm right. sorry, I'm talking way too much, but the way they framed it, that if you're against any of this, you're some kind of a bigot. If anybody says that to me, I just ignore them. I just assume that you have an IQ of a cow. <laughs> if you're going to talk to me like that, you have to be kidding me that because I don't accept radical gender theories that are, to put it mildly, highly controversial, this makes me some kind of a bigot. You gotta be kidding me. I mean, you absolutely have to be kidding me. I'm sorry, now I'm gonna keep quiet. You go ahead and talk. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, in relation to the point you just made, that it's like a Winston Smith moment from 1984. If they can hold up three fingers and get you to say that there are four there, right? And in, as in the case of 1984, not only to say it, but to actually believe it, then they can do anything. I mean, whatever one might have thought about other movements, in more recent changes, significant changes, in this case, they are, they are trying to get us to believe that a male human being can be transformed into a female human being. Now, we're not talking about dressing like one or behaving like one or going through surgery, but actually change sex. And this is an extraordinary claim. You don't have them in the States, but here in Ireland, we have a Gender Recognition Act from 2015 and this one from earlier in the century in the UK. And a very interesting thing about the significant passages in both of those acts, which are almost word for word identical, surprise, surprise, is that they go something like this. If a person's gender is dot, 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 dot gender, and you get gender, 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 and then the final sentence is, then the person's sex shall be that of a male, and the person's sex shall be that of a female. And if you look at this, if you know anything about legal draftsmanship, you have to think, this is either a spectacular example of incoherent and sloppy legal draftsmanship, or it's a deliberate attempt to obfuscate the difference between sex and gender, whatever gender may or may not be. Well, here's the thing, though. That's exactly what they say somebody like you is doing or that I'm doing or quote unquote conservatives are doing that they're blurring the distinction between sex and gender because they go around saying there are only two genders, male and female. And these people will come back and say, well, there may be two sexes, but there are many genders. And, and so, you know, we're not denying the one, we're denying the other. Okay. So can you try and reckon with the claims being, because some of them even say that some of them even claim the mantle of science. They say, well, Science shows that gender identity is very fluid and it's distinct from biological sex. Can you try to make sense of this for us? Well, Because I mean, no, you no. spend a lot of time on it in the book. Oh, yes, I do. You see, okay, so I have a chapter called The Sex and Gender Two-Step. And my point is that sometimes the proponents of these views want sex and gender to be the same. So when you call them into question, they say, oh, they back into this identification and, and they say, oh, you're just being stupid about this. And then when they want to, they differentiate them completely. So my question has always been, what is gender identity supposed to mean? I know what your sex identity is because we can establish this by objective criteria. Okay, your biological formal expression in a body, your internal organs, your genetics, all of those are capable of being identified, not just by you on the basis of some feeling, but by anybody who cares to inspect you. But nobody knows what a person's gender identity is. And here's an epistemological question. How do you know what it is? At most, if it isn't absolutely nothing, which I strongly suspect it is, but nonetheless, if it is not absolutely nothing, it's something like a subjective feeling that 
say I'm a man and I say, I have this kind of feeling that I'm really a woman. To which I say, well, okay, I have a feeling that I'm an extraordinarily rich man, but it doesn't make me one. <laughs> okay, so this is the only thing it can be. And the trouble then, of course, is that when you make it to be a matter of a feeling, there's an possibly infinite number of genders. Okay, not just two, not even three, but nine, 47, 123. When I was writing the book a year and a half ago, I think the number was up to something like 156. And I was just thinking, you know, if you're going to bring this into a census form, <laughs> you're going to have to do two things. One, make the form extremely long and B, keep revising it daily. It's just not possible. So the idea of gender identity really doesn't make any sense at all. There's no objective criterion by which one can determine what this is. And while people are perfectly free to feel anything they want, if it comes to that, that's not really the point. The point is what I and others are being obliged to do, which is to deny that somebody who is obviously male is female and to deny that somebody who is obviously female is male. And that's the only point, really. I mean, in a sense, I see I'm a libertarian, Thomas Well, you know, if somebody wants to go around pretending he's ambonic or ambigender or any of these mad things, hey, it's a big world. I don't really care. <laughs> okay. It's just that I am not prepared to say, for example, if a man, I'm not prepared to use a pronoun she when it's clearly he. I am prepared, by the way, to avoid pronouns altogether at some cost to my linguistic abilities. But nonetheless, I'm not prepared to call somebody by what I regard as the objectively incorrect pronoun in English. But what about people who say, and you have this in there, I was born in the wrong body. Now, again, that is also a kind of a subjective thing. And one of the arguments that you raised that was actually provided to you by a supporter of all this as an example of an argument that somebody like you might make was that take somebody who has anorexia, an anorexic woman, anorexic woman is absolutely subjectively convinced that she's overweight. And yet objectively, that's false. So we don't because, well, her subjective impression trumps everything. So therefore we say, well, I guess you are overweight. <laughs> hey, everybody, this is an overweight woman. We don't do that. <laughs> no, we don't. Why would this be any different? We don't do that. And indeed, it would be grossly irresponsible if somebody went for medical or psychiatric treatment to be told, yes, you are an extraordinarily fat person. You need to diet. <laughs> They're already, if you like, stink thin. Okay, can you imagine? Or somebody who suffers from body identity dysmorphia, for example, who thinks that they are extremely ugly or whatever when they're not, and wants their face changed and so on. There's a whole range of things. In fact, it's quite extraordinary because this is the only case of a kind of dysmorphism in which we are not only exhorted, but being required to support and affirm what the person subjectively believes. That's very, very strange. And here's another interesting thing, Tom. I don't know what it's like in the US now, but here we have laws against conversion therapies. Now, this originally came in the context of homosexuality, where people were providing conversion therapies to homosexuals to change them from being homosexual to not. So this is outlawed. And now the case is being made that if you, as a psychiatrist, question somebody's subjective understanding of themselves as being male or female, you can be accused of conversion therapy and subject to the law on those grounds. And the interesting thing here is, it seems to me, that if a person's subjective feelings and their objective biology are in discord, right, they can be reconciled in two ways. One, you can reconcile it by changing your psychology, okay, to adapt to your physiology, or by changing your physiology by surgery or by hormones to adapt to your psychology. Both of those seem to me to be forms of conversion. Yet the more drastic form of conversion, which is surgery and hormone, doesn't seem to be regarded by our lawmakers as a form of conversion at all. Whereas trying to reconcile somebody's psychology to their objective physical status is now going to be outlawed. I know I, I, I feel like I keep asking the same question in different ways just because I, there's so much that's been said and written about this and I'm trying to come to terms with what exactly the argument is. But what would be the pithy response? I mean, I feel like some of the responses that you're giving, even though they seem like common sense to most people, even if most people are afraid to say it, you know, that obviously this is not a woman. This person I'm looking at is not a woman. This is obvious to everybody. 
but most people have been cowed into, you know, they don't want to hurt feelings mm -hmm. and they don't want to be on the outs with the regime because the regime is very, very much pushing this and we don't want to be unpopular. So we'll go along with whatever we're told. But we really are being told that it's backward and unscientific and unsophisticated to think that mere genitalia tells you anything, that you could indeed have this subjective feeling. And yes, they could say that, okay, maybe you got us on the anorexia point, but that this is so, I mean, your weight is not really fundamental to who you are, but feeling like I'm actually a man, but yet I've been given this particular body, that is so fundamental to who somebody is that maybe there is something here. This many people are saying that they are having this subjective interpretation of their lives, then maybe we need to credit it. That's not a completely mad point, but let me just give you some sort of data on this so we can maybe ground it a little bit. Gender dysphoria, this feeling of, I feel like, tension between one's bodily nature and one's perceived gender identity occurs not exclusively, but largely in people in their teens. And in the case of boys who are young men who experience this, if they're not treated and then people just carry on as normal, they will resolve that tension in the direction of their biological reality to the extent of about 80 to 85%. Okay, So it looks like a phase that they're going through. With the case of young women, it's slightly different. A lower number of them will reconcile their so-called gender identity, what they feel like, with their bodily structures, something in the region of 55 to 60%. But still, it's statistically significant. So by and large, it's something, in other words, people go through phases in their life when they feel strange about all sorts of things, right? But there is, if I may, and I don't know if this is too much for your listeners, but there's a very strange idea here at the back of this, which when you think about it, is bizarre. When people talk about being born in the wrong body, that it only makes sense if it's possible for you to be a you before you are embodied. Now think about that for a second. What are you before you're embodied? You're not anything, okay? Moreover, even if you could, as it were, pre-exist your embodiment, you don't have a body which makes you either male or female. In other words, it's not for nothing, for example, that in the Christian tradition, angels who are purely spiritual beings and now no corporeal structure are always regarded as being without any sex. They don't have a sex. They're not male or female, although conventionally we, we refer to them by male and female names, just as we do to God, for example. God's another example. God is not a sexed being. So this is philosophically untenable. It doesn't make any sense. That doesn't mean, by the way, that we treat those people who genuinely, who are not simply going along with the fad, but those who genuinely have a sort of strong internal experience that their gender, whatever that means, is different from their bodily structure, that we treat them with contempt, or that we don't try to support them and get them through this phase, or that we, you know, we treat them badly. None of that follows. But being nice and being kind and being considerate has a limit. And the limit is you're not, you cannot be forced in the end to tell a lie simply to save somebody's feelings if it's a serious matter. Yeah, we do it all the time with trivial things, but not when it's serious. And that's the problem. Can you say something about so-called TERFs, who are so-called trans-exclusionary radical feminists. Yes. Because I find it, I always find it interesting when the left starts carving itself up because one, one group thinks the other group has gone a little bit too far, and that's always a bad thing. We can never go too far. So <laughs> you who think we've gone too far are evil and reactionary, even though by any objective standard, you're extremely left-wing radical. You know, so what's going on here? Well, this actually is fascinating, and the situation changes almost daily. So, the, well, I call this the turf wars. And what has happened is that, of course, the notion of gender was brought in in the 1960s by John Money and was seized upon by radical feminists for their own purposes. And so there's a sort of strange and kind of schadenfreude-like <laughs> joy in seeing this come back to haunt them. They've sown the wind, <laughs> they reap the whirlwind. But what's happening is that they are finding that the gains as they see it that feminism has achieved, particularly in terms of special privileges and 
or not even privileges, but say female-only spaces and all of the rest, that now that those are being invaded by men who are claiming to be women, and they're furious about this. Okay, so what has happened, at least on this side of the Atlantic, I don't know if it's happened in the USA or not, is that the acronymic monster, the LGBTQIA plus entity, is starting to split. And so between LGB and the rest, we are seeing a split. And there is now a thing called the LGB Alliance in the UK, which wants to kind of, as it were, to get rid of everything after L, G, and B. They say what we're talking about with L, G, and B is sexual orientation, okay? And after that, it's kind of crazy stuff. So we don't want anything to do with that. And I find that amusing. And in fact, this is the last point I'll make on this. We had a parade, an LGBT, all the all the letters, parade in Dublin. And then about two weeks later, there was a trans parade on the zone. And I was wondering, why is that? Aren't you supposed to be all part of the same lovely group? And the answer is no. So there is a deep tension here. And I've become something of a kind of a hero to the turfs, which is kind of amusing <laughs> because of my views on feminism generally. But on this issue, I'm firmly on their side for once. And I find that not a little amusing. Let me step back and ask the big question here, which we get a lot, which is, why does it bother you if some people are just living in a way that they believe to be most authentic? Isn't this just a matter of just mind your own business? This doesn't affect you. Just leave them alone. Even if they are all wrong, Mm. let them be wrong and silent. There are a lot of wrong people in the world. So why does this matter so much? Well, and that's a good point. And the answer is that doesn't bother me. Okay, so for example, there is a uh, transgender person in the UK called Debbie Hayton, who got into trouble with her trade union by wearing a shirt saying, trans men are women, get over it, (laughs) even though this person is trans him or herself. So as a libertarian, I don't really care. It doesn't matter if you're a man, you want to call yourself Belinda and walk around in a dress. I don't have to associate with you. It's not a big deal. So the problem isn't really, as I say, it's like they say in relationships, it's not you, it's me. In this case, I'm not concerned about what these people, in a sense, are doing here or what they're doing. It's what the law, and this is where it really kicks in, because the Gender Recognition Act, taken together with Equality Acts, force people to say certain things and indeed implicitly to believe certain things. And failure to do so has legal consequences. That's where it bites. That's why it matters to me. And indeed, even in writing this book, I had to put in a page at the start to say that because of the legal situation in this country and in the UK, I am going to use certain expressions so that I don't bring myself within the purview of the law. And this is the problem. So it's not about others. I'm, I'm a libertarian. You do what you like as long as you're not you know, violating the zero aggression principle. But it's what I am being forced to do in terms of what I may or may not say. And indeed, in some cases, what I must say. And that's a real problem because it's an infringement on my liberty. That's why it matters. Hey, everybody, I want to recommend a person to you. And that person is Mikkel Thorup, who was my guest on episode 2183. And Mikkel is the host of the Expat Money Show, which is the number one resource for anybody considering the expat lifestyle or offshore investments. Your host, Mikkel Thorup, has been an expat For over 20 years, he's visited over 100 countries and himself lived in nine. And so he has invaluable insight on the expat lifestyle. And that includes how to maximize international investments, how to move offshore for more freedom, privacy, and protection. You're going to gain vital knowledge on wealth protection, tax reduction, investing, migration, citizenship, residency, you name it. You're going to love Mikkel as a person because he's very knowledgeable without being an arrogant jerk. And the variety of topics he covers on the Expat Money Show, where he's telling you about all different countries, all different things you might want to do there, like buying property or getting a job, all this stuff is covered on the Expat Money Show. So go to expatmoney.com today. The link will be in the show notes. That's expatmoney.com or listen wherever you get your podcasts.
Let me ask you a little something about the title. Obviously, it's playful. It's a play on words, hidden agenda. But, you know, if there weren't a bit of truth to it, you wouldn't have used this title. Because mm-hmm. the open agenda is to throw all kinds of what we thought were stable categories into turmoil. But the open agenda is simply to make certain people more comfortable who are presently uncomfortable. But is there a, quote, hidden agenda? And if so, what is it? And how do you know what it is? So the answer to that question is, I think, yes, there is a hidden agenda, but it's, as it were, one of those agendas that's hidden in plain sight. This is the culmination of the sex revolution that began in the 1960s, or indeed, if you believe, Pachiram Sorokin, the sociologist in America in the 1950s, believe it or not. And whatever one thinks about feminism generally, and whatever one thinks about homosexuality and the acceptance of that and all of the rest, this is the sort of final push. Because if you can get people to self-censor in this area, sort of to verbally accept what is sort of a manifest falsehood, then effectively you can do anything. This really is the world of 1984. And that's the agenda. It's to rewrite everything, having as it were more or less to do with human nature. Now, if you're really... Con- I was going to say, if you were conspiratorial, you might link this to the Great Reset. But in fact, the Great Reset isn't a conspiracy in the sense that it's well known. It's they advertise. (laughs) So it's a conspiracy which actually has a publicity department. And this is part, it seems to me, and I'm going a little bit beyond now what my book does and so on and sort of stepping out a little bit. But it is an effort, as it were, to recreate our lived in world, the world of our human experience, treating everything that we've had so far as if it's purely plastic, as if we can remodel it in any way that we choose. And this is the epitome of remodeling. And if they can get this through, they can do anything. To come back to something you said at the start, by the way, Tom, which I think is perfectly correct, and I and many others have been absolutely astonished at the rapidity from which this thesis, the transgender thesis, has moved from absurdity to orthodoxy in what is, socially speaking, a split second. And in doing so, it has carried not just the good thinkers and the leftists and so on, it's carried the media, the politicians, and the legal establishment with it, which is quite extraordinary. I've never, it's like a bizarre social virus, which has, as it were, captured and taken over its host in an astonishingly short space of time. Bewildering. Historians will look back on this and they will write about it. And one of the things they're going to comment on is the speed at which this has happened. Now, again, I know that there are probably some true believers, but in terms of the people who really kind of get what's going on here, it seems to me almost certain that it's motivated by the same kind of hatred and loathing for bourgeois normality that has been at the root of other movements in history. But this one, above all, I do not see this coming from a place of love. This is not how this movement has conducted itself at all. It has been nothing but, I hate to use the weasel word intolerance, but it's been nothing but that and shutting people down and banning books. And when the normal response would be, look, I realize we're asking you to accept an awful lot in a very short period of time. And we're asking you to accept kind of the opposite of what you were told by all respectable institutions your whole life. So we're not going to demonize you if you're not immediately on board. There's been absolutely no grace of that nature shown at all to anyone. So therefore, it can't possibly be motivated by love and care for marginalized individuals. There's got to be a hidden agenda, so to speak, in this, right? Because if that's all it was, then the movement would act a lot differently from the way it actually acts. No, that's, uh, that's absolutely true. I think that's correct. One point I do want to make, and I don't want to finish this conversation without making it, is that as a libertarian, obviously, I believe that any mature and and responsible adult can make whatever decisions they want to make in relation to their body, even if it means as they are cutting off perfectly healthy limbs as apothemophilia acts to. But when it comes to children, it's slightly different. And what we've seen, for example, in the Tavistock Clinic in the UK, and to some extent here in Ireland, because some Irish children have been sent over there, is that children are having these, what in many cases will turn out to be temporary feelings of estrangement from their body, taken as a sort of given. And changes are being made, often through 
hormone treatment, but even more radically through surgery. And the trouble is that <laughs> there's no going back. Okay, If you cut off somebody's testicles or you cut off a woman's breasts, you can't just sew them back on again. Okay, If they actually change their mind on these matters. And it's one thing for an adult to do it. It's another thing altogether for children. And so we've seen some kind of pushback in this area recently. And in fact, the Tavistock Clinic has come under severe criticism. And there is a growing kind of feeling. It makes me feel quite happy that people, it seems to me, are beginning at last to wake up. And that we realize that we can be tolerant of adults who want to do certain kinds of things. But when it comes to children, it's entirely another matter because they're not in a position to make these decisions themselves. And the decisions that are being made for them, by and large, are having, in many cases, catastrophic and irreversible results. And this is a real problem. But one of the objections that they'll have to what you're saying is that people who detransition or who vocally regret having transitioned are actually quite rare. And so they'll say conservatives are just holding individuals up like this as poster children for their point of view, but they're actually, in the raw numbers, there just aren't that many people who have this view. Now, two points that occur to me against that would be, number one, in this environment, I don't think I would want the whole loving, open-minded, tolerant trans movement coming after me by openly telling everybody I regret my transition. I think that's about the last thing I'd want to do <laughs> after everything I've been through already. Now I want to have people who were once my allies come down on me and humiliate me in public. No, thank you. So that's one thing. Second thing is this has not been going on that long. It's a little bit too soon, it seems to me, to say, oh, everybody's happy. Well, okay. <laughs> I mean, this hasn't really been a thing for all that long. <laughs> yeah. No, those are two excellent points. I'll start with the second one again, which is, yeah, the time issue. Well, in many cases, the experience of people who've transitioned has been positive immediately after, say, the hormonal treatment or the surgery. I can accept that. That seems to be the case. It's not necessarily the case, however, that if you track these people through time, and we only have a very short time to do that, that the happiness persists one of the problems is that the data shows that many of the people who see themselves as transgender actually also have a whole range of other psychiatric problems. And they have a propensity, by the way, to commit suicide at a staggeringly higher rate than people who don't. And these problems are not treated by their surgery and they don't go away. And then to come back to your first point, those people who have detransitioned and come out, as it were, have been viciously attacked as sort of traitors to the cause. So you are absolutely right. If you've done something that you thought was a good idea, and you've discovered that not only is it not a good idea, but it's a very bad idea, and you, as it were, revert with all of the damage that's been done to your body, probably the last thing you want to do is to become the victim of this vicious attacks on you online and accusations of being traitors to the cause and so on. You really have enough on your plate. This suicide question, mm. what they'll say is they're committing suicide because we're not affirming them. If we mm. affirmed them more, they wouldn't be committing suicide. That just doesn't seem to pass the smell test at all. No. I mean, they've been affirmed right now in this moment in history more than at any time ever, ever. And yet we're being told that the problem is getting worse. Well, how could that be? Should The problem should be getting a little better. It doesn't make any sense at all. I think the movement itself is causing the suicides because it's leading them into confusion and despair and irreversible changes. That's what's causing the problem. Not that the how could you be more affirmed than in a society that revolutionizes its legal system, revolutionizes its language, yeah. revolutionizes its social mores at the drop of a hat for you? And that's not enough? No, indeed. This actually links up to another point, which is that we've seen a spectacular increase in the number of young people coming out as transgender. And you have to ask yourself, why is this? Is this because we always had this number of people, we just didn't notice it? Or is it something new? And if it's something new, why is that? And the answer would seem to be, it's like a form of social contagion. So let's take an example. And by the way, I'm not accusing any one person of anything here, but let's just take this as a sort of an abstract point. If you are a 
13 or 14 year old boy or girl, not particularly gifted in any particular way, just part of the crowd. And you see that if you come out as transgender, you will now be treated as a hero. You will be validated. You will be held up. You will be, you will receive enormous attention from all the people around you. Well, why wouldn't you do this? And I'm not saying again that this is a part of cold calculation, but people are swept up in these kinds of movements. And we've seen them throughout history and they don't persist. Right. And given the sheer numbers we're talking about here, it's impossible to believe that we're not dealing with this phenomenon to at least some degree of yep. uh, being swept up in it. And then not to mention, you get the almost irresistible thrill of being able to call everyone your senior a bigot. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's something thrilling about that. Not only all these other things, but you get to be morally superior to almost everybody. That's that's hard <laughs> to resist. It's impossible to resist. I wish I'd have been around when I was a teenager. <laughs> So, look, the book we've been talking about, Hidden Agenda, Transgenderism, Struggle Against Reality. I'm going to link to it at tomwoods.com slash 2215. Obviously, I feel like we could go on for quite some time on this. But if you were to share a parting word about this subject, what would it be? I mean, maybe as we part, maybe I, I will impose myself back on the conversation and say 50 years from now, where will this be? Will this be something that we were all embarrassed about and pretend it didn't happen and people who got swept up in it will say, oh my goodness, that was a mistake. Or is it so hardened now, the different sides of this, that it would be impossible ever to admit that you were wrong. You would just have to dig your heels in and we just continue to be deeply, deeply divided about this forever. Or does one side conquer the other culturally? What's the outcome? Well, I don't think you can stay in a situation of balance. And what really worries me here is the sort of solidification of this strange ideas, these strange ideas in the legal system. And that's the problem because they tend to have a long life there. So while a particular kind of mania for, I don't know, Pokemon or whatever it might be, can come and go in no time, it doesn't get embodied in your legal system. But for example, I don't know if you're aware of the case Bostock, the 2020 case, which interpreted Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 as covering not only discrimination on the grounds of sex, but discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation and transgender status. This is from the Supreme Court. It was a 6-3 ruling where the lead opinion was actually written by Gorsuch. Okay, And then the usual five on the other side. And the centers were Kavanaugh, Alito, and Thomas. And Kavanaugh wrote this incredible dissent where he accused the others of actually of making law by legislation. Sorry, I beg your pardon, making law by... Uh, Supreme Court decision. Yeah, through the court system. It's an extraordinary case. And in fact, Alito's dissent is scathing. I, I've rarely seen a dissent which expresses so much scorn for the, for the majority opinion. <laughs> it needs to be read. I discuss it in the second last chapter of the book. But yeah, that's actually very, very striking. So to come back to your point again, how will we look on this in 50 years' time? I think with some degree of embarrassment, and it may be that the laws will sort of sit there and not be enforced. That's probably what will happen. Or with a bit of luck, they might even be reversed. I am looking forward. I mean, my ambition, if I can affect it in any way, is to try and bring about the reversal of the Gender Recognition Act here in Ireland, certainly, root and branch. because. As long as that's there, okay, all of this is support. This is the sort of the base, the foundation which supports all of this craziness. If that were to go, then the rest of the legal transgender edifice would eventually collapse. The same would be true in the UK with their Gender Recognition Act. Here you have a problem because, sorry, when I say here, I mean in the USA, you have a problem now because of the Bostock ruling. And that was done by the way, with a Supreme Court which allegedly has a conservative majority. That reminds me of a project I might have mentioned on the show, but that I'd love to see somebody do in the United States, a book called Great Dissents. <laughs> you take the dissents from some of the landmark cases in American history where we're all taught that this is an unambiguous progressive victory and we should all be all right-thinking people think one way about it and see what the non-right-thinking people thought about it. You know, the, the ones who were demonized, ignored, erased from history. Let's reverse that erasure and put them back in history 
I would love to see a book called Great Descents. You know, yeah. wouldn't that be fascinating? Because we we've never heard any of these arguments. We have absolutely no idea what the Supreme Court thought about, you know, or, or a minority of the Supreme Court thought about major questions over the course of history. No, I think that's a great that's a great idea. And yeah. uh, I mean, Kavanaugh wrote a dissent, and he was joined in it by Mr. Justice Thomas. But Alita wrote his own dissent as well. So that's two written dissents in this case. In that one case, yeah. Which are very striking. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't read either of those, so I'm going to make a point to do that. So anyway, check out the book, Hidden Agenda, linked at tomwoods.com slash 2215. Professor Jared Casey, our guest, the author. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure talking. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.